The final advance, 2,400 shells were needed. The helicopter could only bring in 36 at a time. It was a long and obvious business. But despite this huge stockpiling of ammunition, some guns were down to their last half dozen shells at the end. It was a close call. The helicopters darted everywhere, worked to destruction. They were pushed to the edge of their endurance again and again. There wasn't any option. They were the only way to push equipment forward fast. At dawn on Monday, we crawled out of our shelters, cold, shivering, and shaken by the severity of the bombardment which had been fired over our heads during the night. The freezing morning underlined the need to take Stanley swiftly before the cold of the mountains in midwinter sapped the strength of the troops. The air still rang with the clash of artillery. Across the valley, the battle for Tumbledown Mountain was still raging, the Scots guards were being delayed, the whole advance was slipping behind. We watched shells still smacking down on rocks and earth. It seemed a wonder that the mountain itself could stand the bombardment without splitting. Occasionally, tiny figures flitted back and forth like matchstick men. By now, the fires surrounding Port Stanley were burning brightly. And then, quite suddenly, the whole position changed. The Argentinians weren't fighting, they were retreating. Hasty instructions were passed on the radio nets. An airstrike was cancelled. The advancing troops were told, fire only in self-defense. More and more information came back. A white flag had been seen. It was virtually <laughs> over. <laughs> I have just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Ready? <laughs> Well, here it is, just before four o'clock on Monday, the 14th of June, and up in our area overlooking the battlefield, the word has come through that a white flag is flying over Stanley. We know that British troops are still advancing on the mountains behind me, but now their orders are drastically different. They are to fire only in self-defense. And so far, there's been no sound of firing, and you'll notice that the big guns are quiet too. The first time these hills have been silent for more than three days. It doesn't mean there'll be no more fighting. We don't know what the position is in the other Argentine garrisons, but certainly Stanley has surrendered and is about to be occupied by the British. It's taken 10 weeks since we left Portsmouth, but this major objective has now been achieved. Tuesday the 15th of June, Stanley woke up to find it was back under British rule. Apart from the Union Jacks that began to sprout, there was no great demonstrations or celebrations. It was enough celebration to drive once again on the left-hand side and walk the streets without worry. What did you think when the British went to begin with? I'm afraid I cried. I cried a lot because, you know, Britain had gone and all we knew had gone and it was just something totally new and unknown to us had arrived and we never knew how they would treat us and, and what would, you know, what would become of us, really. Did you think of leaving yourself? At the beginning, yes, before I realised that the forces were coming out here. But when I realised the forces were coming out here, I wanted to stay and see it through. Uh, and now? And now I want to stay too, for appreciation for what the British troops have done for us. I want to stay. You see, we, we lived almost surrounded by the soldiers, which is known as the sort of military zone and time and time again I'd go to the door and I'd find seven or eight, nine soldiers standing there with guns and all sorts of excuses. I gave them the tape we could, I tried to be as kind, as friendly as I did and I waved to them because, because... You didn't uh, know what was going to happen? No. Mm. Well. No, and so um, when, when you find these people, they, although I don't, they never hurt any civilians, not one I don't think, but it's, 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 it's just so terrifying living and brought up in a British colony as we had been. Perhaps I shouldn't even say colony now. But we were so British and then to find all these guns here, it was just terrifying. And I stood at the door and I used to cry and cry. And just, uh, well, it's, it's, it's over now, isn't it? And the, yes. and the British are back. 
and so. we're very grateful and, and we can only pray and pray now that I thank God you're here and offer up a prayer for the souls of those who've lost their lives. Down from the mountains came the British troops, marching proudly through the town they'd come to liberate. How are you feeling, lad? Great. Fantastic. Get the pubs up. <laughs> Give us a cheer. Yep. <laughs> They didn't look like men who just walked across the island, but they had every step of the way on their own two feet. Fifty miles they'd come over mountains and bogs in weather that chilled the bone and soaked the skin. And at the end of it, they fought bravely and well. Now they were coming in from the cold for a hot meal, a bath and a change of clothes. The first in three weeks. Everything had hinged on the fitness and the resource of the Marines and the paratroopers who'd come ashore on that first day and never stopped walking. I'm delighted that we've got into Stanley and that though our casualties have been uh, sad, we've had far lighter casualties than I expected when one looks around at what's in Stanley in the way of weapons and how many men were holding the place. So I'm extremely glad that they decided that uh, they would rather have a ceasefire. Well, why do you think you, you got away so lightly? I know any deaths are tragic, but in because, military terms, this is very low, isn't yes, it? Yes, because our guys were very well trained. Uh, we had very good artillery support, and we tended to use the night as our friend to attack, which helped us enormously in that we were able to close with them uh, during the hours of darkness, and then have to fight through, admittedly, in darkness but at least we didn't have to walk for long distances over these very open hills being fired at while we were closing with them. Mm -hmm. Mind you, you had to walk all the way across the island. What condition is everybody in now? Well, remarkably good. And when you've just seen 4-5 Commander go past, you realize they've walked from Port San Carlos to Stanley, and then in the end spent two days dug in on Sapper Hill, and they've spent all the time dug in, moving forward, marching and fighting. I mm. reckon they look pretty good in spite mm. of that, it's don't been you? snow, cold, everything up there, Yes, isn't it? very cold. So much so that one of the company commanders, who was a very large and uh, tough officer, told me that he was actually blown off his feet on the top of Mount Kent by the, by the wind, which is quite something. For the Marines of Naval Party 8901, it was a happy homecoming. They were the detachment who defended Port Stanley against the original Argentine invasion. Now they were back, raising their flag outside Government House. The Falklands flag, a Union Jack, inset with a sheep. The first problem was what to do with the Argentine troops laying down their weapons in great piles in the streets of Stanley. They'd had plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition, but lacked the will to fight on. They'd expected to be beaten, they were. The British troops never thought defeat a possibility. In the last hours before the surrender, Argentine officers and men were reported to be firing at each other. Now they were marched out to Stanley Airfield in thousands. But the British counted just over 6,000. The Argentine officers said there were twice as many. Nobody was totally sure how many men there were, what units they'd come from. The airfield, several miles from the town, made an extraordinary sight. It looked like a refugee camp with long lines of men trudging through the mud. They were left there to fend for themselves until ships could take them back to Argentina. They lived off their own rations, made shelter from whatever they could find. The British put a sentry on the road to Stanley and left them to sort themselves out. There was nowhere they could go, nothing for them to do, but wait forlornly among the wreckage. The 
airfield out on a headland is a desolate, windswept place, made worse by the wreckage of the British bombing and shelling. Bukata aircraft stood about, some destroyed, others bright, almost new, strangely so in the devastation. The airport buildings were skeletons, blown apart by the British bombardment, which continued until the last moment. Huge craters showed where the Vulcan bombs had been dropped. But despite the enormous firepower directed at it, the runway was still serviceable. With the fighting over, General Moore, the land force, the first, again, into Port Stanley, and the first to